Okay, again, our thanks to all of you being here to our caregiver webinar. Um, Jess Berg is an OT doctoral student from Washington University in St. Louis, and she, she's here doing her capstone project with us on caregiver support. Um, she has just been outstanding in being here with us because here's the deal. Jess is coming to us virtually from Michigan, even a different time zone. So right now, during this pandemic, we are, we're obviously learning. We can be anywhere and sharing our education and our programming to folks. So we want to thank you all for being here. And Jess, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, sounds good. Um, like Jeanette said, my name is Jess Berg. I am an occupational therapy student um, from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, but yes, I am currently here in Michigan, um, completing my doctoral portion of my degree at the American Stroke Foundation. So, so wonder what Zoom and uh, virtual communication can do. Um, so thank you guys so much um, for taking the time to attend this webinar. I really hope it's helpful and you guys um, get some great knowledge and tips and tricks from uh, this webinar. So um, this webinar specifically is titled The Importance of Self-Care as a Caregiver. So that's exactly what we are going to be talking about. Um, there we go. Um, so first, before we kind of dive into the content, I kind of want to have an overview for you guys about exactly what we are going to be discussing and what I want you guys to get out of this presentation. Um, so first, um, I want you all as caregivers to become familiar with the different sectors or categories of self-care. Um, second, I want you to understand the benefits and the importance of self-care. Then thirdly, um, I want you all as caregivers to understand the consequences um, of neglected self-care. And then lastly, um, I want you all as caregivers to become familiar um, with self-care activities and techniques to use in your everyday to day lives. So first, um, kind of defining what is personal care or self-care. Um, so personal self-care is a conscious act one takes to promote their own physical, emotional, and mental health. Um, so personal self-care is associated with perceived stress, emotional well-being, and general health in caregivers. Um, addressing this part of caregivers' lives is super important um, to promote overall better well-being um, and increased quality of life. So kind of um, talking about what are some types of personal self-care. So there are different categories and I'll be talking about a few of them. Um, some of your self-care that you already do may not fall into any of these categories um, or you might notice um, some similarities of some of the things that I will be discussing. So first we have um, the category of physical self-care. So physical self-care, um, as you might guess, is um, taking care of your body. This could be through physical activity like exercise, yoga, um, just getting yourself up and moving, walking around the neighborhood, um, taking your prescribed medications as a doctor prescribed you, um, attending doctor's appointments, attending your own doctor's appointments. It's very important to keep up on those and to make sure you're um, looking out for your own health as a caregiver. Um, also sleep quality, which I will get into a little bit more later on how that's important um, as a self-care activity. Um, yes, sleep is a self-care activity. I know it sounds kind of strange, but it is. Um, and then something that I want you all to keep in mind throughout this presentation is um, there is a very strong mind and body connection. Um, if you are mentally fatigued or struggling, um, the physical aspects of your body may struggle as well and vice versa. And you'll see that theme throughout this presentation. The next part um, or sector of self-care would be the social self-care. Um, so this is really uh, involving your socialization and social outlets, so your um, social support. Um, it's really important as human beings um, to really have that social connections with others. And I know right now during the pandemic, it's, it's very difficult. Most of our social connection is all um, virtual or for some people, it's, it's really non-existent. And we really thrive on that face-to-face -face, um, conversation, which is why I think Zoom and FaceTime um, is a great alternative right now. Um, so in social self-care, you kind of have these two um, categories. So you have the building and the maintaining of relationships. And I'm sure you've all experienced um, that from pre-stroke to post-stroke, um, you as an individual and your loved one have had the opportunity to build new relationships, new relationships, whether it be at 
the American Stroke Foundation, um, at other rehab centers with um, other um, stroke uh, survivors or other caregivers, um, at support groups, um, just really a lot of different um, places that you probably have built these new relationships. And once you build these relationships, you also want to maintain the relationship as well. Um, so pre-stroke, you had relationships with families and friends and coworkers. You want to make sure that you're allowing yourself and affording yourself time to maintain those relationships. Um, so that way you're keeping your social um, circle big. So when you do need some help um, or need advice, you have a lot of people to reach out to. Next, we have the mental health and emotional care. Um, so you're gonna see a theme throughout this presentation that um, a lot of the uh, physical self-care and emotional mental health um, and spiritual self-care are going to be connected. So keeping that in mind as you might hear me repeat some things. Um, so one of the big things that I'm also going to reiterate throughout this presentation is practicing self-compassion as a caregiver. We talk to ourselves the most out of anybody else in the world and our inner dialogue um, should be positive. So practicing those positive affirmations and just being nice to ourselves, saying nice things when we look in the mirror. Um, or saying nice things to ourselves when maybe things don't go as planned. Um, you all are such amazing individuals who are partaking in such a valuable role as a caregiver, but you need to remember sometimes that that's not your only role. Um, it can be really hard to get engulfed in that role um, and not um, participate in other leisure activities that you might enjoy. Um, also, um, you might not have or want to take time for yourself because you feel a sense of guilt or um, fear that uh, if you leave your loved one alone, something might happen. But it's really important um, to participate in valued activities and take that time for yourself um, throughout the day um, in order to care for yourself. Um, also, um, keeping connected to your social supports, like I talked about, um, maintaining that dialogue with your social supports. Um, it's amazing what a quick conversation or a coffee date can do um, for your mental health. Next, we have spiritual care. Um, so spiritual care doesn't necessarily mean um, religion. It could mean um, you're just nurturing your spirit. Um, so meditating, praying, reflecting, um, attending religious services, if that's something that's important to you. And I know right now that's all virtual, so, but I know there are a lot of options um, where you can attend religious services uh, virtually now. So that might actually be more accessible for some people if um, you have difficulty leaving your home. So that is a great um, way to take care of yourself and practice self-care as well. Um, so I went over those um, four categories. Those are not the only categories. There's um, personal and professionalism, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, but those are just an outline of um, some of the categories of self-care. So next, I kind of want to touch on why is it important to take care of yourself and be available for yourself and what can happen if you're not? <clears throat> Um, sorry, I'm working on two screens right now, bear with me. <laughs> um, it can be really easy um, as a caregiver to get enveloped in your role as a caregiver and kind of to lose yourself in the role and to lose your identity in the role um, and neglect kind of your own personal wants and needs. Unfortunately, um, if one does not take care of themselves, there is increased risk for um, psychological and physiological problems um, immediately and down the road because um, as you all know, um, caregiving is a sustained lifestyle change um, that will take up a majority of your life. Um, so some of these uh, negative aspects that can occur if you're not taking care of yourself are depression, sleep-related problems, poor quality of life, anxiety, and other health issues or um, exacerbating certain health issues that you already have. Um, so how Caregiving can impact the ability to take part in self-care activities and routines. I'm sure you guys are all like, duh, like we don't have enough time in the day. Like there's only 24 hours, which definitely isn't enough to get everything you want done. But it's really, really important to prioritize yourself because if you're not taking care of yourself, um, then that can have negative repercussions on your loved one's health as well. Um, so kind of uh, probably bring a lot of you back maybe um, months, years back to the initial response you had to the role of caregiving. 
So studies have found that during the initial onset of um, stroke, caregivers immediately put aside their own wants and needs and um, halt their other activities, um, such as leisure work and volunteering to care um, for their loved one. And as time goes on, um, caregivers were found to return to some of the activities that they did enjoy with use of respite care, that social support of family and friends and um, improvement of their loved one. Um, activity changes um, definitely occur through the natural aging process, but caregiving or the role of caregiving definitely speeds up that timeline. So you can kind of have a double whammy if you're, you're aging, but also a caregiver. So you're losing um, some of those really valued activities that you probably um, saw as self-care for yourself. And some of the reasons that uh, caregivers may not want to partake in them is um, fear or guilt of leaving their loved one alone. Um, also hesitation to do activities that you both did before um, for fear that the person with stroke um, may not be able to do the activity or they may get frustrated and it could cause more turmoil in the relationship or even a limited social network where you don't have somebody to care for your loved one while you take time for yourself or an extra set of hands to do the activities that you like to do because you yourself aren't able to do it on your own. Um, so all the responsibilities and tasks um, can fall on the caregiver and sometimes on solely one person. So that can be really difficult um, because you may feel a, or experience a self-imposed sense of responsibility and the idea that staying home with your loved one is what's best and halting all other activities is what's best to only focus on the role of caregiving is what's best. That's might be your initial response and even might have a sustained response um, for years after the caregiving role has been assumed. Um, but this can result again, like I've talked about that role engulfment of um, caregiving being your only identity. And so that causes that reduced time spent working or participating in leisure activities. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have experienced that. And then again, it's a sustained lifestyle change. Um, so this is something that as a caregiver, you're going to experience for an extended amount of time. Um, and let's go to the next one. So kind of talking about overall caregiver health. Um, so it has been found in the literature that caregivers often disregard their own health, like I had kind of talked about um, for that initial response um, post-stroke. Um, so they disregard their own physical, social, and mental health while they focus on the relative of stroke. Um, kind of uh, going back to that uh, definition of personal self-care. So those aspects that um, physical, social, and mental part that um, caregivers often disregard is directly related to personal self-care when they're also disregarding that as well. Um, so I'm sure as caregivers, you um, it's been seen in literature and I'm sure you all relate to the idea that um, there's a lack of time and fatigue as reasons that um, you might not be prior prioritizing your own health or that self-care aspect of your day-to-day -day lives. Um, but unfortunately when this happens and caregivers forget to take medications, this results in certain things like lowered immune system responses, lower wound healing, and higher risk for developing chronic illnesses. Um, so health outcomes, of, it's been studied in the literature quite a bit. The health outcomes of caregivers are often directly related to the recovery and the health of um, the care recipients. So if you as a caregiver are not doing well and you're not taking care of yourself, this can actually result in poor health outcomes of your loved one as well. So if you're having a hard time rationalizing or prioritizing self-care, just think about it as I'm taking care of myself so that I can take care of my loved one to the best of my ability because no one can pour from an empty cup. Um, so kind of diving into specifics. Um, so um, caregiving does have an impact on your um, psychological well-being. I'm sure some of you guys have experienced this. Um, caregivers often experience higher strain and poor quality of life than the general public as a result of caregiving, and this can lead to increased rates of anxiety and depression. Um, problems related to sleep are really common. I told you guys I would circle back to this. Um, so such issues that are related to problems related to sleep are decreased daytime enthusiasm, that poor sleep quality, and increased use of sleep aids. Um, specifically adult caregivers who are caring for others, such as their children, um, or maybe you're a caregiver to two individuals, 
are also taking care of your household and you're simultaneously working or volunteering, you can be um, at a high risk for sleep loss. So studies have shown that caregivers who receive five or less hours of sleep per night or those who use sleep medications three or more times a week are more susceptible to these sleep-related problems and poor overall health. Sleep <coughs> is super, super important. Um, it kind of resets our bodies each day, um, kind of takes that clutter out of our brain and gives us a fresh new start the next day. Our sleep cycles are really, really important to our overall physical and psychological well-being. And one way that um, as a caregiver or just anybody in general can um, combat, combat these problems related to sleep is getting into a sleep hygiene routine. Um, so sleep hygiene is actually a form of self-care um, and uh, it can be personally customizable to whatever works for you um, and your needs and um, what time you go to bed at night and so forth and just what works for you in general. Um, but some examples would include um, reducing your screen time 30 to 60 minutes prior to bed. Um, researchers have shown that that blue light that's given off by our iPads, laptops, um, smart devices, cell phones, TVs um, can reduce uh, the amount of melatonin that is produced in our body, which helps aid in um, falling asleep. Um, also, trying to have a set bedtime and a set wake time is important. Getting your body on that sleep cycle is also going to help as well. Um, another option would be um, trying calming scents. Um, I know there's not a lot of research out there on the effectiveness of essential oils, but um, I have found that calming scents like eucalyptus or lavender um, and a diffuser right before bed um, helps me to calm down and kind of wind down. Um, or having a face care routine or just a routine in general right before bed can help with um, that sleep hygiene routine as well. Um, also dimming the lights. Dimming the lights helps with that melatonin production, which helps um, facilitate sleep. Um, so like I said, sleep hygiene is a part of self-care and that can definitely be something that um, you do um, each night. And I really encourage that. It's, it's shown so many benefits for so many people. Um, I believe uh, some research has said that if you do your sleep hygiene routine for 21 days straight, you will start seeing results. So the next um, sector I want to talk about is the impact of caregiving on cognition. Um, so family caregivers already experience a restricted occupational world in which their surroundings can be less stimulating um, with lack of social participation um, just due to their demands as a caregiver um, or the uh, or I guess the ability of their loved one to um, go out into public or how comfortable they feel um, going out in public with their loved one, especially right now with the pandemic. Um, it's like a double whammy. It's even more restricted occupational world and less stimulation for all of us. Um, but this is definitely exacerbated as a caregiver. Um, also experiencing decreased community integration, social participation is something common that has been found in the literature um, for caregivers as well. Um, so all of that kind of combined might cause a lack of cognitive stimulation and that overall impacts cognitive functioning of caregivers. Um, so that isolation um, causes that decrease environmental stimuli um, that can impact that um, functioning for caregivers. Um, also, um, depression and depressed moods in caregivers also influence cognitive decline as well. Um, and as we all probably know, cognition is extremely important for everyday life and our everyday occupations, um, and most notably the occupation of caregiving for a lot of you. It's important to stay sharp and be awake and alert um, and to have our brain working at um, full capacity. Um, so just in general, um, there can be an impact of caregiving on cognition and ways that this can kind of be combated is um, to definitely that social participation, making sure you're keeping connected to those um, social outlets um, that you're stimulating your brain, you're doing puzzles, crosswords, all sorts of things as part of your self-care routine um, or your writing or your reading. These are all things that are gonna help improve your cognition. And then next we have the impact of caregiving on um, physiological well-being. So research um, actually looks a lot more at the psychological well-being of caregivers um, than the physiological well-being, but this is also very important as well. 
Um, physiological issues um, are common among caregivers, especially when um, you are caregiving for more and more hours. Um, as your hours ramp up, your, um, your chances of getting injured are higher. Um, so if you're injured, you're not able to provide the care that you would love to provide for your loved one. Um, also in relation to physiological issues, um, there's this ongoing release of um, cortisol. Um, and that ongoing release of cortisol um, has seen in the literature to be um, something that causes a weakened immune system and other physiological issues. Um, the hormone of cortisol, how it makes sense to me is that there's this fight or flight pattern that I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and your body is constantly producing the stress hormone cortisol um, and is even more seen higher in caregivers because you guys um, often are anxious or stressed because caregiving is a very, very demanding um, role. Um, and you're constantly in this flight mode. And it's really, really hard for your body to maintain that flight mode. And that's going to lead to your body to kind of shut down that weakened immune system and those physiological issues. Um, also, if you have an individual um, that you're caring for, a loved one that has increased physical dependence of a person, you're probably performing more transfers and physical activities, which can lead to those injuries as well. Um, the most common thing that caregivers have cited in the literature is that lower back pain, um, which eventually could cause the inability to provide care. And then that's a risk um, for nursing home placement um, and then higher health costs in the long run than keeping your loved one um, in the community or in your home or in their own home where you can care for them. Um, but luckily with self-care, like I'm going to preach throughout this whole presentation, um, taking time for yourself, making sure that you're prioritizing your own health um, is going to really help with that physiological well-being and decrease um, some of these things that could happen if you're not caring for yourself. Um, so kind of segueing into what I just said. Um, so it's really, really important that you guys are taking time for yourself. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm repeating this so many times, but it's so important. Um, the literature supports this. Um, it's not just me telling you this. It's lots of other people who've done um, lots of research on um, how important it is for caregivers to take time for themselves. Um, so higher levels of burden and um, mental health issues have been seen with um, higher rates of caregivers um, having occupational and leisure loss. So taking that time for yourself to combat that and to um, try to decrease those levels of burden and um, presence of mental health issues by um, taking part in those occupations and leisure activities that you enjoy is really important. Um, so it's important um, to avoid that role engulfment or that loss of self in caregiving. Um, I've already said this once, but I'm gonna say it again. It's really important that you're not lost in the role of caregiving and that is not seen as your only identity. It's a very important identity and um, it's a, a sign of strength and um, resilience. Um, but just knowing that you might have other identities. You might um, have the identity of a mother or a daughter, um, a husband, a brother, an aunt and uncle, and making sure you're making time for those identities as well, or a friend, a coworker, anything like that. Um, so also maintaining social connection is really, really important, like I've reiterated throughout this entire presentation. Um, that in turn is going to decrease caregiver burden and increase quality of life. Um, if you're not taking time for yourself, caregiver burnout is, um, is pretty common among caregivers and it's actually the leading cause of placement of loved ones in nursing homes. And I'm sure you all wanna keep your loved ones in the home um, and keep them in the community. Um, and so just taking time for yourself, you're taking time for yourself to care for yourself so that your loved one is cared for as well. Um, next, just the importance of participating in valued activities. So research regarding relationships between valued activities and well-being has been heavily studied and it's shown that loss of valued activities um, can negatively affect caregivers. Um, however, if there is an opportunity for caregivers to engage in these valued activities, um, their emotional vitality and well-being is enhanced. Um, so having those social supports and outlets um, to be able to participate in those valued activities is important. Um, something that is beneficial for both the person with stroke and a caregiver is in engaging in mutual activities too. I'm sure you and your loved one love to do stuff together as well. 
Um, so engaging in those activities together can elicit higher levels of um, positive affect, um, higher levels of general mental health statuses overall, lower levels of depression, lower levels of burden, and lower levels of strain. So even if the activity is something that you may have not participated in previously, or it might be something that you have done previously but just needs modifications, um, anything really participating together mutually can also really enhance that emotional vitality and well-being as well. Um, so self-care doesn't just have to be something you do by yourself. It can be something that you do with your loved one. It can be something that you both enjoy. Um, so really um, don't limit yourself to just self-care being something that you are doing on your own. Um, so how, big question, how can you participate in self-care as a caregiver? Um, so we'll kind of dive into that. So um, how caregivers maintain activities as part of self-care. So first, it's important to accept that um, from pre-stroke to post-stroke, certain activities may not be able to be resumed, um, or they might be able to be resumed with creative new ways to participate in activities and occupations. So this could be adjustments in activities like modifications with use of adaptive equipment, um, shorter durations of the activity, or just increased assistance um, by either you helping your loved one out or having an extra set of hands there to help you both do the activity. Um, also, um, learning to ask for help as well. Um, just know as a caregiver, you are never alone. There are so many resources out there, um, and there are so many support groups and people at ASF who are more than willing to help you out and to give you suggestions or even provide a helping hand. Um, so it's really important as caregivers to know that you're not alone in this process, that there is a plethora of um, resources out there for you um, and you're not um, weak for asking for help. That is by no means um, what you are. You guys are all strong, resilient individuals, um, but it's completely okay to ask for help um, during the caregiving process. Also, um, Another way is to create a daily routine that incorporates me time. So that time to take care of yourself, that self-care. Um, again, it can be something that you do by yourself or something that you and your loved one enjoy or both throughout the day. But it's just really important to incorporate that in your schedule and your routine throughout your day and try never to go a day without doing some form of self-care. It could be um, a combination of those categories that I talked about, the physical, social, or it could just be one of them, but try to hit them all throughout the week so that way you have a balanced um, self-care wheel for yourself. All right, kind of getting into some of the quick techniques for self-care. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different um, self-care activities out there um, and self-care is not always like hour long baths or weekend trips. It definitely can be those. Those are, I'm not discouraging those at all, but it can also be something that's done in um, two to 20 minutes with mindful exercises or grounding techniques that can be really done anywhere. It can be done um, when you're laying in bed at night, when you're sitting on the couch um, with your loved one next to you. It can be when you are um, riding on the bus or in the car, just anywhere to kind of bring yourself back to center and kind of have time to um, reflect and uh, have some self-care time. All right, so kind of like I said, self-care is um, something that can be done in a couple of minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, a weekend. It can really depend on what you have time for and what your schedule allows you. Um, so this slide kind of provides some ideas um, for what are certain types of self-care. And so I'll let you guys kind of read over it, but um, in the five minute category, it could be something like drinking a glass of water. Hydrating is really important. Make sure you're drinking throughout the day, um, drinking water. Um, <laughs> you could um, write down 10 things you're grateful for. Um, you can give yourself a foot massage, whatever really um, helps you kind of calm down, lowers your heart rate, decreases your blood pressure, kind of brings you away from any negative thoughts you might be thinking and helps you focus on this task at hand. Or it could be 15 minutes, like taking a shower, having a little cat nap, um, pampering yourself, um, spending time outside in nature, going for a short walk. Or it could be an hour or more if you have time where you can binge watch a funny show, um, create a vision board, 
um, I don't know about you guys, but um, I know this sounds really weird, but when I'm feeling stressed or anxious, I have to organize. Things have to be um, organized. I tend to reorganize my closet and my drawers of clothes a lot. So that's something that I do for self-care, which kind of doubles as a chore as well. So I guess for me, it works out. Um, but uh, really anything on this list or anything that brings you um, peace and kind of brings you away from negative emotions is considered self-care. You might be looking at this list and think, um, I didn't know that was self-care, but yeah, anything that um, brings you kind of some alone time or something you might do with your loved one that you enjoy and brings you happiness and joy is considered self-care. It might be a good idea um, for you all to keep a running list of self-care activities that you enjoy. Um, you might want to try some new things, but it's not your thing, or you might have some already in your day-to-day -day lives that you um, tend to do. Um, so making sure that you're keeping them in your schedule um, throughout the week and you're scheduling them into your routine is really important. I know you probably all know that as a caregiver, having a schedule or routine is extremely important, but making sure that that schedule or routine for your loved one isn't just for them, but it's for you as well, because you're both going to benefit um, from yourself taking that time for self-care. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about um, some grounding exercises. So grounding techniques are utilized to help you reconnect with the present and um, the external stimuli around you. So it brings you out of um, a panic attack, a distressing memory, or an unwanted emotional state of anxiety, stress, um, whatever emotional state you do not want to be in at the time. Um, so one of the ones that I have actually used myself and is seen in research a lot is the 54321 exercise. So this exercise, um, when you're doing it, you want to maintain a steady and slow breath. So you can all kind of do this with me if you want to. So you're going to start to slow down your breathing. Just take nice deep breaths. And you're going to look around whatever room you're in right now. And you're going to name five things you see. So if I were doing this right now, I see a Kleenex box, a plant, a picture, a dog leaf, and a pillow with uh, the state of Michigan on it. So while you're doing this, you're still taking those nice deep breaths. So the next thing is you're gonna name four things that you hear. And I'm in an apartment complex right now, so I can hear quite a bit. So I apologize if there's any background noise. Um, but right now I can hear my dog breathing. I can hear the diffuser. I can hear a car that just went by. And I can hear my neighbors walking around upstairs. And then the next thing, you're gonna keep breathing nice and deep. You're gonna name three things that you feel. So when I say feel, it's not the emotional, it's actually the um, sensation of touching something, what your skin feels. So right now I feel my feet on the carpet. I feel the sweater I have on, the material. I'm not sure what kind of material it is. And then I feel my back up against the couch. And you're gonna keep breathing and then you're gonna name two things you smell. So right now I smell an apple cinnamon candle and the eucalyptus spray that I have in my diffuser. And then you're gonna keep breathing and then you're gonna name one thing that you taste. And I just had coffee prior to this, so I can still taste a little bit of the coffee on my tongue. So that's kind of an example of one of the um, exercises you can do in a quick like three to five minute window to kind of bring yourself back to center. Um, this is something that I have actually used um, before I go to sleep sometimes. So it helps kind of wind down and then um, helps me uh, go to sleep. I mean, depending on how decorated your room is, you might not be able to find five things, but um, it's just an, uh, an idea or an opportunity to try it maybe tonight when you're going to sleep. So the next grounding technique is reciting phrases or using numbers. Um, so this could be uh, something that you do in your head. It could be something that you do writing it down um, or you can say it out loud. Um, if you're saying it in your head, 
make sure you're visualizing each word in your head. And if you're saying it out loud, make sure you're paying attention to the shapes your lips make when you're saying the phrase or the number. And then if you're writing it, make sure you're paying special attention to how you're writing it. How does your hand feel on the pen? How are you making the strokes um, to create um, the phrase or the number? So the phrases um, that you could be writing, um, saying in your head or saying out loud could be your favorite poems, your favorite song lyrics, um, any religious verse that is important to you or book passages. You just wanna make sure that it's something that um, you're well versed in and that you enjoy um, saying, thinking or writing. Um, you could also do numbers. So I'm not a huge number gale, but I know there's people out there who um, find uh, their selves back to center when they um, recite times tables, count backwards from 100, um, or you can choose a number and think of ways you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide the number to get back to your chosen number. Um, and again, these are things that you can say in your head, you can say out loud, um, or you can write down on the paper. Again, just making sure that you are paying attention to um, how it sounds and how you are moving your lips when you're saying out loud, how you're visualizing it in your head and paying attention to how your hand feels when you're writing um, and the strokes that you're making to create those numbers. So next um, for grounding techniques is building categories. Um, so this one, um, is something that you can use for musical instruments. Um, you could even break it into, I don't know if we have any people who are very musical out there, but uh, wind instruments, brass, string, um, percussion, um, types of vegetables you might enjoy. Thanksgiving is coming up. So you could also name what's in a cornucopia and visualize that as well. Um, it's important that while you're doing this, you're kind of visualizing um, the instruments too, or the vegetables, or even sports teams. If you're a sports fanatic, um, that's something that you could name, whether it be basketball, soccer, football, anything like that to um, keep yourself centered and keep your blood pressure low and keep you focused on a task. So the next one um, is a breathing exercise. So pursed lip breathing. This is something that I've actually used with clients in the past. And I've even used after I do um, strenuous exercise too, because it helps um, pretty quickly reduce your blood pressure and your heart rate when you're feeling stressed or anxious. Um, first, you want to kind of sit or lay in a comfortable place. So I'll, we'll do this one together. So I'll have you guys get comfortable. Um, so you want to relax your body starting with kind of your jaw. So release the tension from your jaw. And then we're going to go down to the neck to the shoulders, make sure your arms are nice and loose, make sure your abdomen is nice and loose, all the way down to your hips, your thighs, your calves, and lastly your feet. So making sure we're all nice and loose. What you're gonna do is you're gonna inhale slowly through your nose for a two count. Once you've done that, you're gonna pucker your lips like you're going to blow out a candle and exhale for four. So inhale for two, exhale for four. You're gonna to wanna to do that for about, I usually do it for about two to five minutes and you can actually feel your body start to slow down. You can feel your heart rate reduce. You can feel your breathing slow. So it's something that you can physically feel. You physically know that you're calming yourself down. And with a lot of these grounding techniques, that's what you're gonna feel. You're gonna feel your heart rate decrease, your blood pressure decrease, which is exactly what we want. All right, good job. So we will move on to the next one. So um, supportive self-talk is also really important, not only as a caregiver, but as um, anybody in general who is uh, struggling with anxiety, stress, depression, anything that's going on in your life um, that might be a negative aspect for you. Um, so supportive self-talk, um, the benefits are highly researched. So it reduces stress, it boosts confidence, it increases your resiliency, um, and it helps you build a better relationship with yourself and others. Um, it also helps combat depression and anxiety. So on the slide are some examples of um, some self-talk statements. So um, some of them are, I am strong, 
I am confident. I am calm and confident, um, which I rarely am, but that, that's a good one. I am powerful and I have so much to offer. So here, there's just a list um, for reference. You guys can create any um, supportive self-talk uh, or positive self-talk that you might want. One thing that I have done in the past that I have found helpful is I place them on sticky notes on my mirror or my refrigerator. So every time I see them, I will say them three times in my head as I look at myself in the mirror, um, or if I see them on the fridge, um, I will say it as well, um, just to kind of keep my mind um, in a pattern where I am constantly saying nice things to myself. Like I had said earlier, we talk to ourselves more than anybody else in the world does, and it's really important that we are nice to ourselves. So practicing that self-compassion is really, really important um, as um, individuals, and that really boosts um, our confidence and our reduces our stress, all those benefits, it's really, really important. All right, next. So guided meditation is also another way we can practice self-care. Um, so it has been proven to yield a lot of benefits. So it's um, seen to sharpen attention, increase resiliency to stress, it increases compassion, improves mental health, and improves relationships, as well as has a lot of physical health benefits. And remembering that that body-mind connection is very much there. So anytime you're getting physical health benefits, you're also getting those psychological health benefits as well and vice versa. So there are a lot of guided meditation apps out there, as well as videos um, that you can really tailor to whatever you're looking for. There's tons of them on YouTube. Um, but some of the apps that you can download on your smart devices um, that I have seen in uh, research to be helpful and I have actually used myself too. Um, so the one that says Calm, that is an app um, that has um, tailored guided meditation that you can um, specifically pick certain um, people and voices that you enjoy and certain um, guided imagery tasks um, as well and you can kind of tailor that experience for yourself. There's also Headspace which is in the bottom where it says Headspace with the orange and the yellow. Um, there's um, Omvena, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's the middle icon right there. There's Breathe, which is the top um, right with the green circles. And then on the bottom, um, you have the Guided Mind, which is the yellow with the lead. So there's lots of different options out there and um, really each person is different and has um, different wants for guided meditation, um, but there's a lots of options out there for everyone. Um, so I included in the presentation, and this will also be included in a handout that I will um, distribute or Jeanette will distribute at the end of the presentation for everyone. Um, so these are specific links um, to guided meditation options. So SageMinder is one that I came across and I've listened to all of these. So SageMinder actually has specific guided meditation to start your day. So that wake up as well as specific guided meditation um, for sleep as well. So getting you to wind down to go to sleep. Um, AARP also has some pretty good guided meditation options that are a little shorter. So if you only have that five minute window maybe throughout the day, um, these might be something that you can kind of tap into. So it has guided breathing options, that positive affirmations, body scanning relaxation, guided imagery. Um, this one specifically is talking about the beach. And then there's guided imagery um, specifically talking about a garden. Um, really, like I said on YouTube, there's tons of different options out there um, for all of you and whatever you're really interested in. So I would uh, highly encourage you guys to check that out. We also have writing and journaling. Um, for those of you out there that um, have a lot of joy or find joy in writing, um, this can be a really, really good tool for self-care. Um, it's something that I have used a lot and has been helpful for me. Um, so writing can kind of provide you a way to identify first what you can and you can't control. Um, so it kind of helps you prioritize those problems. So um, something that I have done is I take a sheet of paper and I write down everything that I might be stressed, worried, or anxious about. Um, and then I go down the list and I categorize them into things that I can control and things that I cannot control. And those things that I cannot control, I kind of tell myself a mantra of you have done what you could, this is out of your control or whatever mantra might work for you. Those things that I can control um, that's on that list, I make a plan for how I'm going to 
address them or tackle the issue at hand. Um, so that way it gives me something to visually look at um, to be able to have a plan in place for how I am going to tackle whatever I'm stressed, worried, or anxious about. So very much that problem solving angle of things. Um, there's also prompt writing, which is a five to 30 minute activity that you could partake in um, based on your availability or just really what you're passionate about. You might have a prompt that you might write for three minutes on or a prompt you might write for 45 minutes on. Um, I know there's um, lots of different prompts out there on the internet if you wanna Google them. I know there's prompt books you can actually buy online that have um, prompts at the top of the page and then you just write whatever you're feeling. Um, so some examples of prompts would be, what emotion are you feeling right now? What is the time you found courage or strength? What is the time you laughed so hard that you cried? And what is the place you find peace at? And you would just basically write about it. You write whatever you want, there's no constraints on it, just whatever, however you feel. Another way um, that you can practice self-care in this writing and journaling um, sector is uh, the tracking your emotions. So tracking your emotions allows you to recognize triggers. So throughout the day, whenever you're doing activities, whether it be caretaking activities or anything else, um, you can kind of pinpoint um, what caused this negative emotion to occur. Um, why was I stressed in this certain um, uh, activity or part of my day? And you can kind of look back and have a visual representation of exactly what was it that caused that negative trigger and maybe a way um, to kind of rationalize or uh, tackle how you might reduce that trigger or reduce um, that uh, moment of feeling stressed or anxious. But also it can um, help you recognize positive moments of your day when you felt happy, when you felt um, like you accomplished something joyful so that you can repeat those parts of your day as well more often so you can more often feel those emotions. Also for self-care, one thing that is important for caregivers um, could be respite care. So um, an option to achieve time for yourself would definitely be tapping into these respite care options. Um, so there's lots of different types of care. I didn't um, put all of them in here, but just the most common are the in-home care, the adult daycare, friends and family providing care. And then especially with the pandemic right now, they're starting to come out with virtual respite care options. Um, so those virtual respite care options um, can be located, um, they're pretty prevalent on the internet right now. Um, and a lot of them stem through um, somebody will watch a movie with your loved one or someone will have a conversation with your loved one for 30 minutes to an hour. So that way you guys don't have to leave your home, um, especially during the pandemic and especially with the rise in cases right now. So these um, different resources that I have listed on here. Um, so first the Arch National Respite Network and Resource Center. Um, this is a website that allows you to kind of find um, respite care options in your area. So on this page, the link I provided, um, which will also be in the handout after, um, it comes up with a map and you can click on your state and then you put in your zip code and it lists all the respite care options in your area. Um, same thing um, with caring.com and Wealth Spouse Association, they have very similar ways that you can find respite care options in your neighborhoods. So um, respite care isn't always cheap. It can come with a, a financial cost. Um, so I also included some of the resources for tips on how to pay for care. So that first resource, which will also be in the handouts, um, kind of gives you eight tips on how to pay for care. The second resource, um, paying for care, uh, this has um, on the main page, it has options for you to explore um, financial assistance, um, what that might look like and how you might achieve that. Um, care planning assistance, because it can be very daunting um, planning your loved one's care. Um, there's both um, free options and um, options that cost money on there. Um, there's also a link for finding affordable home care and assisted living for your loved one, as well as um, how to get paid yourself as a family caregiver. All right, and then this is just something I wanted to include, include and will also be sent out to all of you. So this is a self-care wheel. Um, I've used this before um, with uh, other clients and with myself, actually. So um, like I had talked about, there's lots of different sectors of self-care. So you've got physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and that personal and professional that I kind of touched on a little bit. Um, so kind of 
keeping that running list of things that you enjoy for self-care, you can kind of put them in these different categories on this wheel so that you know you're hitting all these different categories throughout your week. Um, and um, again, like I said, this will be sent out to you guys. So you can make as many copies as you want and use it um, throughout your weeks. All right, and then just as I wrap up, I just um, want to highlight some important things. So um, this whole presentation has been on self-care. So it's very, very important for you as caregivers to take care of yourself first. Put those oxygen masks on yourself first because you can't care for yourself if you're struggling to breathe or you can't care for your loved one if you're struggling to breathe. Um, you also cannot pour from an empty cup either. So just taking time, taking time for yourself to perform that self-care is really, really important. Um, taking responsibility for your own care is also very important, making sure that you are prioritizing it. One thing that um, I read um, that really, really stuck with me was that um, self-care is not a luxury. Self-care is a necessity. It is something that should be seen um, as important as um, drinking water or eating food every day, um, which are also parts of self-care, but it is extremely important. It's a necessity, not a luxury. Um, also, uh, identify your personal barriers. What are, what are you struggling with um, in order for you maybe not prioritizing that self-care? What is it exactly that is standing in your way and kind of create a plan to problem solve um, those barriers that you might have? Um, and also um, set realistic goals for you and your loved one. Um, a lot of times people will set really lofty goals, but just set those little ones. Maybe set a goal for, I will take five minutes for myself today. And as time goes up, ramp it up to 10 to 15 to maybe an hour in your day, depending on how much time you have. Um, but again, it's just really, really important to um, set those goals, prioritize yourself and take responsibility for your own care because you cannot care for your loved one if you yourself are not taken care of. All right, and then here's my resources that I used. Um, and then that's it for the presentation. And thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you for listening. And I will take any questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Jess. That was really good. And we'll find time here. I'm going to stop the recording now so folks can ask questions. And then Jess, if you want to take off the share screen. Uh, yeah, of course. I'll